Listen to a lecture in a zoology class. Good afternoon. In this lecture, we'll focus on a common nocturnal animal, the bat. There are two types of bat: microbats or true bats, and megabats, also called fruit bats. Let's start with megabats. Size-wise, megabats are from two to sixteen inches in length. Megabats have extremely sensitive sight and smell. This helps them locate the flowers and fruit upon which they feed. It is while eating that megabats play an important role in the distribution of plants. Like bees, megabats serve as pollinators. When they lick nectar or eat flowers, their bodies become covered in pollen, which they, in turn, carry to other trees and plants, thereby acting as pollinators. In fact, many of the fruits and vegetables on our tables, such as bananas and peaches, would not be there if megabats did not pollinate plants and trees. Next are microbats. As the name implies, microbats are quite small, about the size of a mouse. To find food, microbats use echolocation, high-frequency sounds they bounce off insects. The most common microbat is the vesper or evening bat. Like megabats, microbats play an important role in the environment. The average vesper bat, for example, can eat 1,000 mosquitoes in one night. By doing so, they control the mosquito population. Listen to a lecture in a zoology class. Good afternoon. In this lecture, we'll focus on a common nocturnal animal, the bat. There are two types of bat: microbats or true bats, and megabats, also called fruit bats. Let's start with megabats. Size-wise, megabats are from two to sixteen inches in length. Megabats have extremely sensitive sight and smell. This helps them locate the flowers and fruit upon which they feed. It is while eating that megabats play an important role in the distribution of plants. Like bees, megabats serve as pollinators. When they lick nectar or eat flowers, their bodies become covered in pollen, which they, in turn, carry to other trees and plants. Thereby acting as pollinators. In fact, many of the fruits and vegetables on our tables, such as bananas and peaches, would not be there if megabats did not pollinate plants and trees. Next are microbats. As the name implies, microbats are quite small, about the size of a mouse. To find food, microbats use echolocation, high-frequency sounds they bounce off insects. The most common microbat is the vesper or evening bat. Like megabats, microbats play an important role in the environment. The average vesper bat, for example, can eat 1,000 mosquitoes in one night. By doing so. They control the mosquito population. Task one. Listen to a lecture in a marine biology class. No other animal instills as much fear in man as does the shark, and no other shark is more widely feared than the great white. However, despite Hollywood's best efforts, 
experts do not consider the great white to be the most dangerous shark in the world. That label goes to the bull shark. The bull shark, also known as the whaler shark, gets its name from its stocky body, flat nose, and aggressive behavior. Bull sharks can reach a length of six and a half feet and are commonly found patrolling shorelines near populated areas. They will eat anything that comes their way, including garbage and other sharks. What makes the bull sharks so aggressive is that their bodies contain more testosterone than any other animal on the planet, even more than lions and tigers. This makes them arguably the most aggressive predator on the planet. But it doesn't stop there. Bull sharks thrive in any kind of water, including fresh water. Scientists have found bull sharks thousands of miles up the Amazon and as far up the Mississippi River as Illinois. In Nicaragua, bull sharks have even been seen jumping rapids like salmon to get upstream. In Australia, a bull shark traveled 80 miles up an inland waterway system and killed a swimmer. Bull sharks are apex predators with most human deaths attributed to them. So what are your chances of being attacked by a bull shark? Not very good, I'm afraid. In fact, more people die every year from falling coconuts than from shark attacks. Remember that the next time you're on vacation, sitting under a coconut tree and worrying about whether to go into that beautiful clear blue water or not. Task 2. Listen to a lecture in an American film class. One movie strongly influenced by the Western is Star Wars. When it was first released in May 1977, Star Wars was a huge international hit. With its big screen effects, Star Wars gave us space as we'd never seen it before. However, Despite Star Wars' futuristic look, it still has one foot planted firmly in the past, namely the Hollywood Western. Perhaps the most obvious way Star Wars borrows from the Western is the distinction between good and evil. In early Westerns, the bad guys always wore black hats, while the good guys always wore white hats. In Star Wars, director George Lucas puts these tried-and-true symbols to work. The bad guys, led by Darth Vader, are all in black, while Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia, both rebels in their own right, are dressed in white. The storyline, too, borrows heavily from the Western. A popular Western theme is the kidnapping of a beautiful white maiden by savage Indians. This is exactly what happens in Star Wars. Princess Leia is captured, not by Indians, but by Darth Vader, a metaphorical Indian chief whose village, the Death Star, is a seemingly impenetrable fortress in which Princess Leia is being held. The rescue of Princess Leia is another way that Star Wars borrows heavily from the Western. In Hollywood Westerns, the kidnapped maiden is always rescued in the end, with the Indians all dead and the good guys returning to the safety of their own land. This is exactly what happens in Star Wars. With Luke Skywalker leading the rebel force, he frees Princess Leia, and together she and Luke are honored as heroes in their homeland. In the end, Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia are unerring symbols of good conquering evil, a civilizing force and an otherwise savage new frontier called space. Task 3. Listen to a lecture in a biology class. Everyone knows Charles Darwin as the man who wrote On the Origin of Species. On the Origin of Species sold well in Darwin's lifetime. However, it did not sell as well as another popular Darwin book. That book, published in 1881, is titled The Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms, with Observations on Their Habits. 
With the publication of this book, Darwin revolutionized soil and agricultural science. Let's take a brief look at how he did it. As a boy growing up in rural England, Darwin was fascinated by earthworms. While most people saw earthworms as an ugly, useless nuisance, Darwin realized their value through a series of experiments. However, his research was overtaken by the writing of On the Origin of Species. Later in life, Darwin returned to his study of earthworms and proved that earthworms were not useless pests, but in fact played a crucial role in maintaining healthy soil. Darwin observed that earthworms were busy at work turning over the soil by eating it and excreting it. The turning of soil allowed water to penetrate more deeply and allowed more oxygen to enter the ground while the fertilizing added nutrients. Darwin proved the earthworm's value by doing a simple experiment. In a field near his house, Darwin scattered small pieces of coal. In time, the earthworms had moved so much soil that the pieces of coal had settled deep in the soil, proving that the worms were indeed at work turning the soil. With this discovery, Darwin proved that the common earthworm was not a pest, but an essential part of the agricultural process. Task 4. Listen to a lecture in a sociology class. On December 11, 2008, the business world was rocked by news no one could believe. Even now, people are still shaking their heads. On that December day, Bernard L. Madoff was arrested for securities fraud. Madoff freely confessed that his private investment fund was in fact a Ponzi scheme, a criminal enterprise in which Madoff took money from one party and instead of investing it as promised, gave it to another party while taking a cut in the process. Ponzi schemes are nothing new. However, the size of Madoff's Ponzi scheme made it the biggest financial fraud in history. All told, Madoff stole close to $50 billion from investors worldwide. In the process, Madoff destroyed thousands of lives, including those of Hollywood movie stars and European nobility. How did Madoff get away with it, and for so long? The answer is simple. Madoff was one of the most respected men on Wall Street. He'd served as chairman of the board of directors of the NASD, the National Association of Securities Dealers, and was one of the first to champion electronic trading. He was active in high society as well, serving on the boards of prestigious universities and charities. In short, Bernie Madoff commanded so much business and social respect that no one ever suspected that he was running a criminal enterprise. And why would people suspect him? After all, his private investment fund was making people rich, even in bad times. Yet when the stock market crashed in the fall of 2008, Madoff's house of cards crashed with it. With stock prices falling, Madoff investors suddenly wanted their money back. The only problem was Madoff could not return their investments. The money had simply vanished. Task 5. Listen to a lecture in an astronomy class. The passage you just read tells only one side of the space race story. What it doesn't mention is that in man's race to conquer space, man created a huge problem with no apparent solution. That problem is space junk. At last count, there were over 10,000 man-made objects in low Earth orbit, including cameras, tools, toothbrushes, and bags of garbage. What worries scientists most is the larger pieces of space junk, such as satellites. When big pieces of space junk collide, they literally explode. This, in turn, creates thousands of smaller pieces of junk, 
all of which are orbiting the Earth at more than 17,000 miles an hour. Combined, these smaller pieces of space junk create a corrosive effect when they hit other objects, much like sandblasting the side of a building. This rain of space junk can seriously damage not only operating satellites, but it is also a threat to all space flights, manned or otherwise. It has been estimated that the space shuttle's chance of hitting a piece of space junk and suffering a catastrophic impact is 1 in 185. To prevent space junk from penetrating it, the International Space Station has been fitted with armored walls. The ever-increasing problem of space junk has become known as the Kessler Syndrome. Donald Kessler, a NASA scientist, describes a scenario in which there is so much space junk colliding and dividing that one day it will be too dangerous for man to travel into space. In other words, the garbage orbiting the Earth will destroy anyone and anything that tries to enter it. Listen to a sample dialogue. Hi, Betty. What's wrong? Well, there's good news and bad. Okay, so what's the good news? I got accepted into Harvard Law. Congratulations. That's fantastic. Thanks. Now for the bad news. Harvard is not cheap. I nearly died when I saw the tuition. Yeah, but it's Harvard. Ivy League. I know. I want to go, but I can't afford it. I already have four years' worth of undergrad loans at this school. If I do three years of Harvard Law, I'll be even more in debt. I'm not sure what to do. What about applying for a scholarship? How are your grades? I'm at the top of my class. There you go. You'd have a really good chance of getting a scholarship. Some scholarships pay all your tuition. If you don't get a full scholarship, you should at least get something for books. I got a scholarship here, and boy, did I save a bundle. Applying for a scholarship is definitely an option. I'll have to check it out. You could also take time off and work for a year or two. You know, postpone admittance. That way you could save money for tuition. You might not be able to pay off the full cost, but you could at least pay off some of it. That way you'd owe less in the long run. Yeah, obviously I have a decision to make. Listen to a sample dialogue. Professor Morrison? Hi, Sue. Come in. What's up? I just wanted to remind you of the meeting tonight in Anderson Hall. Meeting? What meeting? The Environmental Club meeting. You said you'd come and give a talk about winning the National Science Prize. Tonight? Oh, no. I promised the Biology Club I'd speak to them tonight in Farnell Hall. I see. But we're expecting a big crowd. We've been advertising it all month. We even sold tickets to raise money. I guess I'll just have to refund them. Look, maybe we can work something out. You know, I could always record my talk to the biology club, then email you the file. That way you could present my talk to your group at your convenience. Yeah, that would work. Also, I'm part of a lecture tomorrow night over at Gethin Jones Hall. The topic is ethics and nano-engineering. You have to buy tickets, but since I'm speaking, I'm sure I can get you and your group in free. I'd be willing to stay after and answer questions about the prize. What do you think? That's a possibility, too. Let me talk to my group first and see what they say. <laughs> 